course. Thank you all very much for tuning in at home. You're watching the Oxford Political Reviews panel on China and Thailand relations. Uh, it is our honor to welcome a very illustrious panel and group of speakers to join us today. And thank you all very much for indeed being here. I'm Brian Wong, the founding editor in chief of the review and also today's moderator. And now it is indeed incredibly important to recognize that the China-Thailand relations are one of the most long, longest standing relationships in the ASEAN region, going all the way back in history to over millennia ago, whether it be in terms of maritime Silk Road, trade, and indeed human to human civil society based interactions. Flash forward a few thousand years, we're now in year 2021, where as a result of both China's Belt and Road Initiative, as well as Thailand's initiative and undertaking to consolidate its economic presence as a rapidly growing country in Southeast Asia and an economy in Southeast Asia, Sino-Thai relations have reached a point, a point that's arguably, some might term, the, past, the point of no return. And others might say, actually, it is a point of constructive engagement and that deepening and tightening of ties would only persist and continue into the future. It is with great pleasure then uh, that it falls upon me to introduce the speakers uh, with us today. So first up, we have Dr. Bogan Balakula, who is the president of Thai Chinese Culture and Economy Association and a former deputy prime minister uh, from 2003 to 2004 of Thailand. And he was subsequently appointed to the president of the House of Representatives. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Bogan. Thank you. Uh, second up, we have the Honorable Bernard Chen, who's a deputy to the National People's Congress of China and also the convener of the non-official members of the Executive Council. He's also a former member of Hong Kong's Legislative Council and the chairman of the Hong Kong Thailand Business Council and an advisor to Bangkok Bank China Co Limited. Thank you very much for joining us, Bernard. It's our pleasure. Uh, next up, we have Joe Horn uh, Pal Palinotai, Joe Head Strategy 613, a boutique advisory firm providing MA and strategic advice on cross border investments to blue chip corporates. And he has a particular focus on Thailand and China. Thank you so much for joining us today, Joe. Thanks for having me. And finally, uh, we have uh, Tida, Tida Yingcha, right? Uh, currently a director of Policy Center of Thai Sang Party in Thailand and a former national MP candidate in the 2019 elections. She is also an alumnus of Oxford. So uh, it is with great pleasure to have you join us today, Tida. Thank you very much. I think you're Thank muted. you, Brian. <laughs> great. <laughs> So let us just get the ball rolling today then with this broad question concerning, you know, where do you see the state of China-Thailand relations standing today? And perhaps with that, we can go just in the order of the introduction. So we'll start with Dr. Bokin and then sort of proceed down the list accordingly uh, from left to right, if that suits. I'll start here with Dr. Bokin. What do you make of the current state of the relationship? Okay. I think that the this kind of relationship between China and Thailand today I think is very close. First, you know very well that our race is so close. We are talking about Thai Chinese uh, people in Thailand. In the past, uh, I think we we had a lot of problems. We tried to, I mean, uh, bring these people with the Thai race, and it's a very good successful success of the country. That's why there are around 10 million I think, Thai Chinese uh, in the country or around 15% of the total population. And these people, they are moving Thai economy, I mean, on, I mean for the middle and then the upper middle uh, term. So uh, if we look into trade and investment, including tourism, in 2019, uh, Thailand top trading partner were ASEAN. China and the US. And in the same year, the top export partners were the US around 30%, China 12%, and Japan 10%. And from January to August 2020, Thailand China trade increased around 0.26% year on year basis. And this, I, I want to tell you that. Uh, Thailand and China is more close in terms of tourism as well. Uh, before COVID, the Chinese uh, tourists 
came to Thailand is about uh, 10 million out of 40 million, I mean, tourists around the world. And this, I mean, number dropped because of COVID. But anyway, I think that after COVID, maybe starting from next year, Chinese tourists will come to Thailand again and in, in great numbers. And most of all, during the COVID time, I think Thai, Thailand and China has close relations regarding I mean, these two countries help each other regarding the vaccine and everything regarding COVID. Up to now, we received around 24 to 25 million doses of vaccines from China. And if I want you to refer more to the past when we had the Tom Yam Kung crisis, the first country that helped us is China. China tried to help Thailand in, in many, many ways. And me too, I am the, the chairman of the Thai China Association regarding uh, economy and culture. I went to China many times before COVID. During six years, I think that I visited China for about 50 times. The only two places that I, I didn't visit is Xinjiang and Tibet. And the rest, you know, and, and working and, and having good relationship with China, it starts from becoming friends, becoming brothers and sisters. Once we start with that, and the rest is so easy. That's why uh, I think that the Chinese regard the Thai people as uh, cousin, as, uh, I don't know, brothers and sisters. I have some younger friends, like my son. He asked me to be his uh, and we are so close. Every time, you know, when I visit there, sometimes he, he flew from, from so far away to meet me just only two or three hours and he went back. And this time also he sent messages to me. How are you, brother? When do we meet again? I think this relationship I, I do not find in other countries. I have many friends from France, from Europe, from the US or even from other countries from Asia, but we don't feel so close as relatives. I think this is very important. So Thailand and China can, can move forward a lot if we start from this. Thank you. Brian, your mic's off. Apologies. Thank you very much, Dr. McKinn. And I believe I'm now audible. Yes. Great. Wonderful. So thank you very much for noting and pointing out the economic and also societal ties and fraternity and solidarity between China and Thailand. Now I'm going to turn the floor over to Bernard, uh, who's perhaps able to shed some insight from your point of view as well. Over to you, Bernard. Well, uh, thank you, Brian. Well, I obviously can share in uh, both my personal and uh, official capacity. As you early introduced me as the uh, uh, members of the National People Congress of China. But of course, that I'm only the one voice among the three, almost 2,900 strong membership of the Congress. So I can't really say uh, that I know for the fact that this is the official. Um, so I'm not speaking officially for China, but definitely I can speak on behalf of Hong Kong, which I'm a member of the Executive Council. Uh, Clearly, Thailand and China has gone back a long way, as you rightly put it. I think more significantly is ever since the uh, normalization of the official diplomatic relationship between Thailand and China in the 70s, I believe. Uh, things have always been uh, working out very well between the two countries. And China has always considered Thailand as, if not the closest ally in the region, in ASEAN, simply because as as Dr. Boken have already rightly put it, uh, they have long-standing friendship. I, I think friendship is the first thing first, right? So, uh, so that has been. Um, I'll, I'll, I think part of that reason is too. There are so many OCG Chinese that have settled in Thailand, and there's a very strong um, bonding already at the people-to-people's -people's level. So, I think that has always been the case. Now, but more recently, uh, to your point, uh, Thailand is definitely a key ally to China in, in the world of politics today. So uh, in China's uh, objective in achieving the Bell and Roll, ASEAN it will be clearly uh, the first stop, right? In, in this whole 
notion of Belt and Road Initiative. And among all ASEAN countries, Thailand clearly is among, if not the, uh, the most trusted partner for China. So, uh, so the question to your questions, you know, where is the status of our relationship? I think it's probably, um, you know, at its peak because they, I can, I can definitely see there's mutual interest, uh, both from Thailand and China, to make this relationship work. And uh, and behind the government's level, uh, government to government level, then you have people to people's level. And uh, I'm on the business sector, so at the my in my personal capacity. I, I see amazing opportunities in breaching. Now I, I'm speaking from Hong Kong, so clearly, you know, Hong Kong want to see ourselves to be a connector, connecting Thailand. But it's no longer just Thailand. We see Thailand as a gateway uh, to you know, the rest of ASEAN. So we would want to see Thailand to have partnership with Hong Kong to go into areas like the Greater Bay Area, and vice versa. I think Thailand will also want Chinese investment. Uh, to Thailand and beyond Thailand, and Thailand is connecting to the rest of ASEAN. So there is there are much opportunities um, at the business level, right? So uh, so so can you imagine? You have government to government level, you have uh, business to business level. Then of course you have people to people level. There's so much um, connectivity at all front, uh, and and to to end the uh, my uh, my. St- to, to confirm my, um, my observation, uh, as many of you might recall, back in 2019, when China celebrated the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, a friendship medal was given to, I believe there were 42 honorees. Uh, these are the 42 honorees that China considered their best friends. And among the 42, there were only six so-called foreigners, and Her Royal Highness Princess Seriton is is one among the six foreigners. She's not only one of the six for six foreigners being bestowed with this highest honor, the Friendship Medal. She's also represented all six to speak at the ceremony. You know how significant that is. I mean, she speak on behalf of those six, and among the forty-two in that single most important ceremony to honor the founding of the you know the people's republic for 70 years so it just shows that china honor and respect the princess and of course the princess represent country thailand so i think i think to sum it up to sum it up i just i can just see that the relationship between china and thailand will continue for a long time to come Thank you, Bernard. And I think what you pointed out there, you know, uh, makes the next speaker, you know, rather fitting to continue and pick up the mantle here. So, Joe, your your personal story is a fascinating one and an incredible one. I think attests truly to how human to human civil society based exchanges, but also ties founded upon emotions of resonance and compassion could truly last and sustain. So here I would like to bring you in for your thoughts and opening remarks, if that suits. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I'd like to really uh, continue on what uh, Dr. Pukin and, and uh, Kun Bernat uh, mentioned just now about, you know, the status of our, our uh, um, relations, Thai-China relations. And, and if, if you want to sum it up in three words, it's great and improving. Um, on, on the one hand, you have really what is what one can consider like a very strong foundation of, of uh, relationship which uh, you know both Kun Bernat and Dr. Pukin mentioned uh, earlier, um, and I, I might add to that uh, the fact that you know the, the Chinese kind of slogan for 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 the friendship with Thailand is is Chung Thai Yi Qin, which is like uh, Thais and Chinese as as if as as one family. You can go around and look at all the other countries with which China is friendly, and and you know there's some. I would say more strategic friends than, than Thailand. You know, we could say Pakistan. You know, Korea. Uh, you'd have, but with none of these countries, none of them, do they have a slogan as strong as this one? So Thailand is unique in that sense, and we've earned it. We've earn, earned it over hundreds of years of uh, of relationship. And you you you, you know you uh, alluded to the, the you know the role my family had in in, in part in building that. And, you know, my mother was sent here. 
uh, 65 years ago. Uh, by here, I mean Beijing. I'm, I'm calling from Beijing now. Uh, she was sent here 65 years ago uh, by her father, who was a senior uh, member of the Thai government, as a secret link uh, to between Thailand and, and China. And she was brought up subsequently for 13 years by Premier Joan Lai. And ultimately contributed significantly to the establishment of the formal relationships in 1975. So it shows that, you know, the, these even when Thailand and China were enemies, uh, the governments of Thailand and China had channels. Uh, sometimes, and sometimes they went, you know, got as creative having a human channel. Um, I would say also, in addition to the excellent kind of steady, you know, generational uh, friendship between the two countries, we also have the you know, Thailand currently in this whole kind of uh, geopolitical environment, which is also beneficial. Uh, on the one hand, you have Chinese, China's own internal economy and, uh, uh, you know, political economy, one could say, which is conducive to having a lot of private businessmen now looking abroad. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, the Sino-West kind of relationship, which is very, very tense now. And I, I would say uh, tense to the extent that the glass has been broken, it will take a long time and a lot of effort to mend that. Meanwhile, you know, you, China looks, you, you know, they look in all directions, they can look in all directions. Where they will find the best and most reliable friend is, is in ASEAN and, and amongst ASEAN, it's Thailand. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Joe. And finally, to uh, round off our round of introductions and introductory remarks, uh, Tida. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, my internet's a little bit bad, so I'm trying to trying to stay connected. Um, so I'm the least experienced, um, I think, panelist uh, here out of um, out of four panelists. I'm probably going to share mostly in perspective of um, modern and. Um, current situations of what was happening between um, China and Thailand. I think it, it focused mostly on um, uh, three main things. Uh, firstly, in terms of the current COVID situation, how it has highlighted um, the very strong relations between uh, Ch China and Thailand. And secondly, in terms of um, how we have seen, um, I think, a, a trajectory of how, how China is uh, attempting to uh, to, to strengthen the ties further apart from apart from um, the COVID situation. And thirdly, uh, my personal experience, I think uh, you failed to mention that I'm doing second my, ma my second master at Tsinghua University. So I think I'm learning a lot of new things that I have not learned before, um, uh, before this. So firstly, in terms of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I think I've seen, you know, as a lot of panelists have mentioned already, that Th Thailand's actually received you know the, the donation from uh, vaccine donation from china as the very first country to actually become very generous in terms of helping thailand um in the in times of needs in terms of difficulties i think we've seen that this signifies a lot of importance that china has put on thailand and unlike any other country has thought of uh, during these times and secondly i think in terms of politics um thailand has three kind of three levels relationship with china one being government to government. I think we've seen that with a lot of um, a lot of a lot of countries uh, being in that level already. And secondly, I think China is making an effort to make uh, a relations with Thailand in terms of party to party. We don't see China making this kind of effort only with the parties currently governing governing the country, but also with other parties who are helping uh, to who are helping being a government or not, but are having this kind of influence and um, decision-making power uh, with, within Thailand itself. And thirdly, in terms of people to people, I think that brings to my third point. Um, with, my, with my study this year, it's actually a direct invitation from the Communist Party of China. It's the first year ever that they actually uh, invited a lot of students from Thailand under the Future Leaders Program to study in China and to uh, further understand and dig deeper in terms in terms of relations between Thailand and China. The very first question that they asked me before I joined the university was that, what was your thoughts on how, how would you would like to write your thesis about? And I said that that would directly hit on um, how China would want to invest in, in Thailand further. And um, I, I refer that to mostly um, the Thai Canal project. And they were very interested in that and they were very supportive of that. And they had a lot of interesting also, um, opinions and comments on that as well. I, I, I leave it there and then um, 
I, I'm going to add to that later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tida. And I think uh, much of what you said harks back to the the excellent days when we were both at the Oxford Union as well. So uh, the, the memories on that front. But I want to just pick up on a point that you raised just then concerning the canal project and also more broadly speaking, the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, if we look at China's investments and also economic presence in Asia and specifically Thailand, there have been plenty achievements and also constructive projects that sought to improve infrastructural and transportation capacity, as well as uplifting, you know, and consolidating commercial ties and links across borders. And yet, a canal that received quite a lot of flack, I think, and controversy recently was uh, the, the Kra Canal project, which would, if constructed, see a substantial waterway excavated in a manner that ostensibly infringed upon, or would indeed, uh, to, to some extent, I suppose, infringe upon the economic interests of Singapore and Malaysia, neighboring countries. And some have also accused the canal project of uh, damaging the environment and also the broader conditions of the Mekong River Delta. I guess what I wanted to ask here, drawing upon this particular example, is I'm not trying to use this to fault find or to identify or to cherry pick reasons as to why Belt and Road might be suboptimal. But I do want to ask, more broadly speaking, how is Thailand and indeed the Sino-Thai relationship going to reckon with and address these challenges and objections, so to speak, to some of the implications of the economic projects that's advancing here? Would anyone perhaps want to start off uh, on this question? Or maybe I can invite Dr. Bikin because, uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, when Joe or when Bernard, you start first. Well, uh, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, Dr. Bukin, I think you were uh, Deputy Prime Minister. The last time uh, there was a kind of very serious uh, uh, push by the Thai government to, uh, to, uh, with regards to the Krak Canal. Uh, so probably on uh, regard with regards to the crack canal, I'm, I'm sure you know, I'll defer to you. Um, um, on my two my two cents on the issue, though, um, is that uh, you know it this project needs to be viewed by Thais as a project for Thais. Honestly, it's really you know it, it's it's going to make sense or not make sense by that by that measure stick. Right. If it doesn't make sense, I don't think Japan or China, but because by the way, it's not just China who wants, who would like to see a canal there. Japan also uh, at the time in, in the early 2000s uh, was uh, quite eager uh, to see it. Uh, Malacca Straits at the time were quite prone to piracy. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, things have changed, but uh, but you know the 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 measure has to be whether or not it makes sense for ties. And and my personal view is, it must. Uh, you know, because otherwise it wouldn't have created so much uh, controversy with Singapore, and you know, it, they wouldn't have been so so afraid of it if it didn't make that much sense for the ties. Anyhow, yeah, that's just uh, uh, you know me thinking uh, from from that perspective. On in a, as a general rule, BRI BRI has been something that has been maligned uh, a, a lot. It I think it's uh, especially in the West. If you think about BRI and in, in the context of you have you're you're living in a you know you're living in a neighborhood, uh, and your you know well-off neighbor comes knocking on your door and says, "Hey, I'd like to rebuild your kitchen for you. You know, uh, I'll pay for it. You know, you pay me back in 20 years. I'll pay for it with a better kitchen. You're going to be able to uh, cook better food. Your children are going to eat more healthily. Uh, you're going to have uh, better tasting food. Um, you know, and everyone's going to uh, you know everyone's going to be happier for it." What are you going to say? You're going to say, yes, please, right? Yes, please, can you also build my living room, right? Uh, and that effectively is BRI. China has, has uh, 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 over excess supply of, of, of capability, more than, more than actually just capacity. They are, have an excess of capability. They have this machine. They built this machine to build a lot of rails and roads and bridges and th and, you know, they have to start building it outside. They, they can't leave the, you know, there's not much left to build in China. They're going to have to go and build outside. Um, so, so it's a natural thing. South Asia, we lack basic infrastructure. Thank you.
just I think it's a good idea. Now, the problem with that sign is that they are, and then some people say, I'm a magician. Someone has 5,000 years of magician buildings. You will want to cut up all the time. I can't quite hear Joe. Sorry. Is that you now? Yes, I think. Yeah, sorry, I think it might be the Wi-Fi on your end, Joe. I'm terribly sorry. I, I believe it was, yes, maybe switching off the camera could help with that. Apologies for that, because uh, we got an audience comment uh, noting the sound quality, so I suspect there might have been something going on with that. But I think what we got from Joe certainly is that there's a substantial degree of economic productivity and also surplus that can enrich both Chinese capital as well as Thai capital. And I guess what I do want to pick up on there, and I'm glad, Joe, you pointed out Dr. McKinn's experience with the canal, is just the question of waterway security and more specifically energy security in the region. And I, I will loop back to you, Joe, once your wife. Wi Hello? Oh, it's much better. Yes. Great. So perhaps uh, you could finish off on a point just then. Terribly sorry for interrupting. Yep, Joe. Hi, Joe. Okay, no worries. Uh, Dr. Birkin, would you perhaps like to uh, weigh in here if that suits you? Okay, do you hear me? Clearly? Okay. I, I think the when you talk about the Grab Canal or the BRI, I mean, the, the Chinese initiative are uh, very important. Many times when I visited to China, I talk about BRI and the Quad Canal. And now I am the advisor of the Tim Kang uh, BRI Association of the CPC. Usually we will have a meeting once a year or sometimes twice a year. And other advisors, they come from uh, many countries, about seven people, former prime minister, former president, former vice president, you know, and they give very advices to, to, I mean, China. I always start this way. I think China is clever because we, you know very well that China is the, the world factory. China produces everything. And in order to communicate with other countries, in order to make, I mean, interconnectivity, China start with, I mean, soft approach. Uh, China do not, I mean, there's a send ships or, or I mean, warships to anywhere. But they try to put can anyone every cancer. Uh, sorry? Yes, Joe, we can hear you now. Apologies. Uh, okay, okay. China tried to convince every country to join with the China initiative by starting with the BRI. Okay, we we work together, we trade together. China tried to tell other countries that uh, we can we cannot live alone. That's why they proposed multilateralism. They respect the UN, they respect the WTO, everything that can make all countries come together and do business together on the win-win basis. I think this is a great idea. So uh, that's why I agree with them. And when we talk about the canal, or the, now we call Thai canal in the southern part of Thailand, I think it's very important. Now, it, it, no use to debate again whether it's, it's good or bad. I think scientific papers prove that it's work and it should be done after, I mean, I mean, maybe we, we do, I mean, uh, further study again and we, we should do that. I'm not worried about uh, Singapore or Malaysia because uh, Singapore now, uh, this country moved uh, forward so far away. So Singapore may not think about uh, the, the crop canal as uh, Thailand will be, I mean, competitioner towards him. I, I don't think so. So, but this kind of will benefit all countries concerned. I used to say in China many times that uh, with the Maritime Silk Road, which China tried to promote uh, in this area from the South China Sea via uh, Malacan Strait to uh, India and to Africa. If you have this alternative, the crack canal, along with the Malacan Strait. This will benefit all countries in this area. 
And you know that the, all the uh, chips between uh, China via this uh, uh, kind of, if we, we can have it, will be immense. A lot of traffic will be done here. So not only Thailand will benefit from this, but all countries concerned will benefit. But to make it, I mean, possible, I think we should talk with the uh, outside. This place will not be, I mean, uh, as just mentioned, that uh, we, we, we must be concerned about security, about uh, many things. Maybe I don't want this area to be the show of force. I mean, Mauritown force, warships to every country. If we build this, this will be free of this kind of warships. This will be used for trade investment and to link all countries concerned only. And if you have the canal only, just digging the canal and sell the canal, I don't think that it would work. That's why we have to create, I mean, economic uh, boundaries there, bringing every site to invest there, to work there, in connecting with other areas, not only for Thailand, but for other countries in Asia, as well as China, or even Australia. We will use this as uh, the world passage. I mean, for maritime uh, sea world. I, 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 once I told the Chinese uh, friends that if we can do this, all country comes and do this together. And this will be the, the landmark of the sea world, maritime sea world. And not for China, but for every country. Because this idea can be claimed just to benefit China. I, I don't think so. And you know that Thailand is a strategic I mean, country in this area, in Southeast Asia. Why China is the most influential country in Asia. And we have to respect Europe. We have to respect the US. We have to respect all countries. That's why I think that this will be a kind of peace, uh, collaboration, investment, connectivity, green development, everything. If we can do this way, this will benefit all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mokin. So I think you touched upon two very important strands of sino thai collaboration. The first being essentially the sourcing and development of more condensed and enriched trade routes and commercial ties on that front. And the second amounts to the value of infrastructural investment and the fact that yields returns and also consolidating, I guess, some degree of mutual in interconnectivity. I want to press you or I guess invite the other panelists to comment as well on what you said, Justin, about a, a multi-party sort of party discussion and an arrangement. And you mentioned ASEAN just then when it comes to Thailand being, of course, a very important player within ASEAN. Now, uh, Bernard and Tida, what I wanted to pick your brains on, perhaps, is within ASEAN, there obviously is internal disagreements. And also, at times, these disagreements often escalate to substantial divergences, for instance, over the issue of Myanmar and whatnot. Now, some have said that China could well pause and pose another source of such divisions and conflicts among Asian member states, as some seek to have a more overwhelmingly pro-China leaning, whereas others want to, like Singapore, <coughs> head and balance and play sort of, not necessarily play, but engage both sides, so to speak. What role do you think Thailand has in mediating between these conflicts as well in, in terms of its stance amongst ASEAN states vis-a-vis -vis China? Do you foresee China, Thailand as stepping up to a more prominent sort of regional diplomatic role, or is it more just you know about re maintaining its relationship with China as it stands economically, politically, military, or otherwise? So perhaps I can uh, rope in Bernard here, given your political expertise and also you know e experience as a politician in that sense. I, I can't claim that I'm an experienced politician, but what I can share with uh, uh, my fellow panelists and those who are uh, listening in is, is well, let me just uh, also finishing off on the, uh, the Bell and Row initiative. I just want to add a, a, a further point here. Um, due to the very, very unique political structure of uh, the Communist Party, uh, Chinese Communist Party, and when China decided on a path forward, they don't just look at short term, right? So the, the, the whole idea of the Bell and Road Initiative is not for something, a quick win. They, do, they are not, obviously a quick win is, is nice, but they're looking beyond that. So if you look at the whole, um, the whole 
backbone of the, the, the Bell and Road Initiative is something like 30 years you know, in, in, the, in the whole making. So we are only now seeing probably the stage one of the BRI, which is largely focused on infrastructure. And that's why all the talk we hear about nowadays about infrastructure, da, da, da. But you have to, but you have to look at this beyond that. I know in most countries in the world these days, you know, politics is short term <laughs> because it's all about whether you make it to the next election cycle. And I guess China will be a lot shorter too <laughs> than most, you, most others. But China don't look at that kind of cycle, right? So they look at phase one, uh, stage one is infrastructure. And then after the infrastructure is built, then it's trade. Because with the infrastructure, then you can promote trade. Now, of course, you can still today, but then it, it, you know, trade will not be as efficient without proper infrastructure. So I think, so the infrastructure is, is, is phase one, phase two is obviously trade, and comes trade, phase three will be that people to people connection, culture, you know, and, and so on. So I think China, when this whole idea of the BRI is beyond just about, okay, I'm going to take advantage of, you know, owning your port or this and that. Now, but, but having, this, having said that, I have to say, uh, China is still learning, right? I mean, this is a very ambitious plan and never done, and not done by any countries. <laughs> well, I guess some Western countries have done that, but they've done it in a very different way. You know, they don't go in there and build infrastructure and trade. Uh, they go in there in a, and, and, and they're looking for a quicker return. I, but China is is looking at this as a longer term. So I have to say China is learning its own mistake as well as they continue to um, build on this whole Bell and Road Initiative. And I'm sure, and one thing about the Chinese Communist Party is they are quick to learn and to recognize and self-correct, right? They self-correct themselves many times throughout the last 70 years since the founding of you know, the People's Republic of China. So I'm sure they will understand that win-win is the only sustainable solution, right? You cannot have one party taking all the advantage and leaving out the partner with nothing. That's not gonna work. So I think China understand that. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna comment on one particular case or one particular project, but I'm pretty sure they con they're continue to improve their way uh, in in the whole 30 years or 40 years journey in this whole BRI. Now, riding on that, yes, uh, increasingly because of the whole the whole different ideology of China uh, with the rest of the world, so to say, um, you know, they, they are now being singled out, right? Because in, when China look at things, they look in such a different a different perspective than the others. So it, yes, it, it does create some issue and increasingly as uh, joe mentioned earlier there's you know these geopolitics and clearly today is really pretty much about us and china right because china is clearly is going to rise up sooner or later to be the single largest economy in the world whether you like it or not it's simply because china is just a huge country so you can see you know is increasingly become an issue for the U.S. So, so what complicates matters now is, apart from the regional geopolitics uh, between, you know, like to your point, the ASEAN and within the ASEAN and China and so on, and China has no issue with that, right? But just that there are the politics, internal politics within the ASEAN. But complicate matter is then you come comes to the U.S. <laughs> and their allies. So I think that that just super complicated and um and that's why in my earlier uh, my opening remarks i think china will, will count on thailand to be their uh as joe put it a friend it's brotherhood it's not friends as joe put it it's not just friendship it's of a brotherhood so so i think thailand clearly will play a very important um uh, role here in helping china to navigate this very complicated regional geopolitics, especially uh, to your point about mentioning about you know, Myanmar and, and all the other different um, other issues that comes with it. You know, and, but China clearly uh, would not want to pick a fight. They should certainly want not to, because they clearly understand that is not in China's interest. So China wants to build friendship, 
China wants to focus on trade, you know, and hopefully a trade that benefit all parties involved and not just China. Thank you, Bernard. And we'll return to both, you know, very interesting discussion points. The first relationship between China and the US and secondly, perceptions towards China later on uh, in a road or down the road in the discussion. But before I bring in Tida, I just want to sort of, I guess, uh, invite Tida perhaps to comment on a particular dimension I think cropped up in Bernard's speech just then in light of the broader bigger picture or the debate that we were having just here, which is one on electoral cycles. So Bernard noted that when it comes to China, obviously you don't really have, um, at least not in a normal sense of the words, of direct universal suffrage engendered uh, regular electoral cycles, but things or elections rather are indeed far more frequent and ubiquitous in Thailand. And I guess, Tita, do you think the attitudes, the friendliness that we talked about just then towards China in the discussion so far are bipartisan or multi-partisan? Or do you see instead the political cleavages in Thailand forming around reception and attitudes towards China in its sense? Thank you, Brian. I think in order to, to answer your question properly, you probably have to assess a little bit in terms of what has been discussed here. I think there are two particular words that describes, you know, what China is doing mainly in, in this region, um, in its geopolitics, and also what, what Thailand is doing uh, mainly as well. I think the first word to describe is in terms of neutrality. You see what China is really doing in this region in the South, Southeast Asia, you know, you see that there's a lot of um, role, um, a lot of stress that China has been trying to do in terms of being, being neutral. And Thailand is reciprocating, doing the same thing, right? You see, when there when there's a there's a claimed you know um, division or instances where you have the South China Sea or you have what's happening in Myanmar, for example, Thailand currently is playing on the on a, uh, taking a very neutral role in terms of responding to that. Uh, it could be by claiming that um, in the case of uh, in the case of Myanmar, being that uh, we have a close proximity to Myanmar. And therefore, they're taking another diplomatic route in order to be able to um, to engage with Myanmar differently um, compared compared to what other countries are doing, for example. And I think the second word to actually describe would be um, how how Thailand is taking this diplomatic um, route of being very defensive, meaning that um, there there are a lot of times that China or even the United States or even a lot of other country civil powers are are taking offense in terms of. Um, pushing policies and Thailand are playing on the side of being very defensive and defensive in terms of um, being receptive to their to their foreign policies. Um, as you as you can see, even going back to what we we're discussing on like uh, the BRI, for example, um, when BRI was laid out, what Thailand is doing is uh, basically responding to what has already been uh, been been framed um, by, by China and, and other countries. And what, what I would like to see actually is for Thailand to be a little bit more offensive in terms of making moves and in terms of um, trying to take this, this leading role in, in the region. So I think one of your, your first questions that you asked is whether it would be possible for Thailand to take this um, leadership role in, in, uh, in the region, right? I think, I think with the current situation, it's quite difficult. If you see with um, COVID-19 pandemic, you see the, the Nikkei, um, Recovery index, for example, Thailand, it's fall, you know, in the, in the rank of 118, which is a very bottom of the rank. But I think if you have, going back to what we discussed earlier in terms of uh, have a world global mega project to actually jumpstart or reset the economy, for example, I think that would really put Thailand in this, um, this very importance of the geopolitics is happening now. I think your final question um, that you asked just now is whether this Thai... Thailand's relations with China is actually um, based on political parties, is it, actually bipartisan. I think we've seen that it's it's mostly, you can see um, in modern Thailand, it's mostly very, very bi bipartisan. But perhaps that some parties may have a little bit stronger relations with China than the other, but it does not go in the directions where they're completely um, against, you know, the, the influence of China coming in. Thank you very much, Tita. And now as we move on to sort of the second part or the second half of our conversation today, I, I want to just touch upon a point that Tita raised just then, which I found quite interesting about Thailand making a move, about Thailand being more proactive in undertaking, I guess, original, I guess, creatively interpreted projects in collaboration with China. 
What sort of directions are we thinking about here and thinking of here in terms of the next steps for deepening Sino-Thai relations? And perhaps here, uh, uh, Joe, are, are you back with us? I, I presume you are. So, hi, Joe. I am here. I'm here. Yes, awesome. I was wondering if you might want to start us off on this one because unfortunately you were uh, cut off by uh, the the technology, the malaise of technology just then. So uh, <laughs> well, it's it's every time I talk about the BRI, uh, my just by chance my connection goes bad. I I've, I've been wondering why. Um, I guess we yes. have to take the initiative. <laughs> In terms of the next steps, I think I think the next steps really the. Uh, the ball is in Thailand's court. Um, you know, we need to make ourselves more uh, ready to 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 be the beneficiary of this, you know, once in a generation kind of alignment of the stars. You know, Chinese uh, private businessmen, at the very least, possibly also the state-owned enterprises, are eager to to invest um, abroad. They are no longer looking uh, to the West uh, as much as they were, and probably not at all. Uh, for good reason, uh, they are no longer welcome there. Uh, they remain, you know, uh, much more focused on 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 something safe, something something comfortable, something friendly. Uh, so we are we tick all those boxes. How do we how do we take advantage of that? How do we make sure it doesn't go to a, a somewhat less friendly, say, Vietnam, which also benefits from other has other benefits or a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, an Indonesia, which has, you know, uh, the dream of, of you know, these uh, many, many hundred million people, you know, that, that uh, the Chinese love, love big populations. Um, so, so uh, uh, you know, how, how can we make the case for Thailand? And that ball is in our court. How can we make it easier for, for foreign investors uh, to come into Thailand? It has been a question that every government has asked and has honestly not done very much about it's it's always going back to the same old bucket of let's just give tax tax benefits you know you, you have boi benefits and you have all these kind of different benefits which are all basically tax 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 benefits i mean there are so many more dimensions that we can play with for example i mean just make it easier to let to get you know qualify people in i mean it is so difficult to get a to get a, a work permit in thailand I, I really do encourage thai officials to, to mirror a foreign, uh, uh, you know, a Chinese, uh, a Western, anyone, you know, a foreign worker who needs to get a get a work permit. You can be you can be the, the CEO of a bank. It is it is excruciatingly painful, right? Uh, so so you know, simplify that. Make it easier to to um, to get money in and out to to register companies. Uh, build the the human resources required to, you know, welcome not just a, you know, 10, right now we have human resources to welcome 10 million Chinese tourists a year. We don't have the resources to welcome, you know, 10,000 Chinese companies. It's a very different skill set. It's a, you know, the, these people need to be trained differently. That training is rapid, you know, two years, three years, we will have that generation, but that machine needs to be started, right? Uh, laws, you know, Foreign Business Act, I mean, it's it's keeping Chinese out. It's not keeping the others out. They figured it out. But the Foreign Business Act of Thailand is keeping Chinese out. All these things can be done easily. These are easy, quick fixes that don't require very much uh, kind of legislation behind it, and and uh, you know can be done by the current government, by by any government. These need to be done. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much, Joe. And perhaps uh, Dr. Bikin, would you have any thoughts on this question? Yeah, uh, I'm happy that Joe raised these questions because uh, in our party, Thai Sang Thai Party, I propose the first thing, I mean, the, the mindset for Thai, I mean, uh, who are in power, even myself in the, in the past, that uh, we are in authoritarianism regime. It means that everything you think, you, you, you like chop down. You order people to do this or that, this or that. And you create a lot of jobs by creating your power. And this is the, the burden for all the people, in particular the small people, to earn their living. That's why now we, we talk about Loki Yotin. But anyway, we have more than 1,500 laws regarding licenses. And how can you do that? 
once you consult with some agency, for example, one department, they will argue this or that, this or that. Like today in the morning, I talk with uh, those who run the hotels in Thailand. There are only, I, I don't, I think that about the 10 or 12 percent that are legal and the rest illegal. But this country moved this way in many, many gray area. So you have to pay, I mean, not tax, but uh, beyond tax to to the influential people, to the, the state, I mean, authority. How we can solve this problem? If, according to the present constitution, you have a section saying that we have to get rid of unnecessary laws and regulations that pose burden to the people. But it's a discourse. You just invent a nice word, nice phrase of words, and then you do nothing. That's why we present this. I think that in order to, to change the mindset regarding authoritarianism, that's why we propose the new constitution draft by the people and endorse through referendum by the people. If this replace any kind of constitution we have since the past, this will belong to people, I mean, in real terms and not just a discourse. And I think that no one can destroy this solution easily again, even the military. And we have to have some clause saying that uh, those who destroy this kind of constitution, you can be sued any time, anyway, because this section, I mean, the new section that I will put in, will be regarded as uh, the Thai constitutional tradition that cannot be deleted by any kind of uh, I mean, good data people, good data orders. And second thing, we are, I mean, the slave of the bureaucratic state, bureaucratic system. That's why we have to promote the state of the people, where people can do things, can move, can create, can innovate anything freely, and not subject to going to the state officials, asking license A, license B. That's why I propose to, uh, issue some laws only the first law i will suspend these i mean license for three years of course some necessary out of uh, 100 1500 maybe we keep just only 100 or 200 maximum and the rest if you want to do anything let you open a small restaurant you can do it tomorrow without going to seek license first okay if you do this we have to presume that the, the Thai people, they want to earn their living, I mean, uh, uh, in good faith and not presume that everyone is bad people. So we have to have rules and regulations that, that, you know, that go directly to these people. I think this is the whole idea, all mindset. We have to change this. And if you ask the state to do this, I don't think that they would do. There is a law during the uh, coup d'etat of uh, Europe per youth saying that we have to give best service to the people. Every five years, all the entity concerned have to come up and talk about this, how we can reduce it. And up to now, they didn't, I mean, get out even one law, but you put more law regarding rights of liberty or freedom of the people, I mean, instead. So we talk about the word liberate and empower the people. Liberate from what? from the state bureaucratic, from the bureaucratic state, from many, many kind of licenses. That's why we suspended for three years, for example. And this is the sandbox during the three years. Let people do what they think, but they have to do it, I mean, legally, and not because they do not yet get the license, they will be fined, they will be, I mean, arrested by the police. No, not that anymore. You do it as you want to do, and how to, empower the people. You know, the small business, they, they you live, I mean, separately. We have to bring them together. Put those who do same thing, who have an association, council, everything, with a touristic person, so that they can voice out, they can tell the government, they can tell the society what they need, what they want. I think that we can do this with uh, about, uh, I, I don't think about 10 laws. If we were in the government in, in the future, we can do this immediately. And this will change the whole thing. Thailand will move forward, I mean, very quick because we let the small people to push the country forward. 
Thank you, Dr. Bikin, and thank you very much, Joe. I just want to just uh, to play devil's advocate here, because I, I agree with, you know, I think, the arguments and points advanced by the both of you. But I suspect, I guess, one possible reason as to why you might fa le face legislative or a populist pushback in certain quarters of the population is that around this classic debate over protectionism, and also where not you think the, the rights of the individual sort of local workers and businesses ought to be prioritized over the competition and competitors you might bring in from abroad, whether it be in terms of migrants coming in, investment coming in, or businesses setting shop, setting up shop in Thailand, so to speak. I suspect one of these sources of the angst or the antagonism here might be the belief or the sense that ultimately by opening up Thailand to, to China, and this is indeed something that's reflected in certain polls or reports that have been conducted recently over this fear that Chinese investment could displace local investment or crowd out local businesses, that once you let the Chinese sort of businesses and workers in, that could well lead to in certain segments unemployment or crowding out of local firms and businesses. So see here, I'm going to bring in Tita and Bernard to see what you might make of this challenge and pushback, and if you think it's valid or if you think it's something that could be easily ameliorated and resolved. Maybe uh, Tita and then Bernard in that order. Okay, thank you, Bern. I think I think this particular debate on the protectionism and you know how how Thailand should open up um, and how you have a pushback from the people. It's not actually exclusive to Thailand. I think you have that um, in different degrees um, depending on a country. So you have that anyway. Um, speaking of which, um, you talk about Thailand, you know, a few weeks ago, there was just a law passed for foreigners to be able to um, to buy houses in Thailand after a ban for quite some time, for I think uh, a decade or a little bit over a decade. There, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of people criticizing this law, saying that um, it, at, during this time, especially during COVID, where you have the, this economic recession and people do not have the purchasing power and suddenly um, the government passed the law in order to allow for the for foreigners to buy houses. Um, suddenly they think, uh, Thai people think that uh, foreigners have flood in, especially those with cash cow, um, especially a lot of, a lot of I think, um, Chinese, um, um, those from China, right? So there, there are a lot of pushback coming from, from the people already. But I think going back to the very principle of um, your question, um, protectionism and you know, how, how Thailand should open up, I, I, I don't I don't think that there is any um, there is any anyone pushing for that um, hundred percent um, opening up and allowing for foreigners, especially um, Chinese, to be able to to come in freely. Um, the right way would be to do it um, by steps or to do it um, with still some protectionism for for the Thai nationals as well. Whether it could be in in the real estate industry, it could be in other um, any other kinds of businesses. So I think I think holding that principle, I think I think it plays along with with Thailand and for for a lot of other countries as well that you still should have certain um, restrictions um, to make sure that eventually it doesn't become you opening up hundred percent to to foreigners. Thank you very much, Tida and Bernard. Uh, well, now I'm going to really speak uh, in my capacity of the uh, as a chairman for the Thailand Hong Kong Thailand Business Council. Uh, to your question, um, is Thailand is um, is friendly to investors? Let me just put it this way, right? Uh, from my experiences in the past twenty years uh, in promoting Thailand uh, to Hong Kong and to China. Uh, you can say that uh, obviously. Uh, you remember, we spent a reasonable time early on to talk about why China and Hong Kong in such a ideal position, the friendship level. All these, uh, you, you can say, you know, it's, it's a great foundation. But when it comes to actually talking about investing, right, there's still a lot of hiccups. Uh, some of these hiccups are bureaucratic, you know, you know, Thai internal politics, and some could be, you know, other reasons. But so, but so Thailand still have a long way to improve itself to be a destination for a friendly investment. And they should be though, because we we should not put Thailand should position itself not just for Thailand only. Is Thailand being a base to invest? you know, to the rest of the ASEAN. So Thailand has to be better 
than the rest of the ASEAN. And, and it should position themselves, right? Just like Hong Kong tried to position itself as you know, one of the one of the gateways to the mainland for that for that reason. So I think Thailand should do the same for, for their region. Um, but to do so, though, I mean, uh, I mean, they have to. Uh, you know, there's a lot of you know, internal bureaucracy they need to uh, to improve. I cite you one example, of, although this is a bit dated. Uh, I still recall back in 2005, uh, I actually accompanied at the time the Secretary of Financial Services and Treasury of Hong Kong government. Uh, to Bangkok to sign uh, an agreement for the avoidance of double taxation uh, between Hong Kong and Thailand. Back in 2005, I was there. I was in the room witnessing my secretary for you know, financial services and treasury to sign the, do the documents. Well, it was a few years later. I can't remember now. It could be one or two years later. Um, one of the major insurance companies in Hong Kong, AIA, who happened to be also uh, have a major subsidiaries in Thailand. You know, I got a phone call from them asking me where the progress of this double taxation thing. And I was a bit, I was a bit surprised. I thought, wait a minute, what do you mean? We signed a document, you know, a year or two years ago. So I thought it was already a done deal. Apparently, uh, yes, it was signed, but Yes, it's still being internally circulated. So it hasn't actually get to the right people yet. So, uh, so you actually have, ta have not taken into effect. So uh, w w when I heard that, I thought, oh my goodness, well, that's not very efficient. <laughs> so, uh, and that was 2005, right? So, and today, I mean, you know, I think, you know, I, we understand the culture of Thailand, you know, you're taking your time, you know, but, China and the rest of the world, they, they move on, right? They, they don't, they're not going to wait around. So I think, you know, to, to, if China would have positioned itself uh, as a hub for that region, they certainly need to uh, raise the bar, right? Push itself up. I know Thailand has been uh, heavily promoting EEC, and I think it's, a, it's actually quite a timely since uh, a lot of the companies are. Uh, divesting, you know, moving some of the production out of China. So EEC could be a good potential uh, as a way to diversify, right? Especially given in the current geopolitics. Yeah, so so I think in the outside, everything is great. I think it looks good, but there's still a lot of these other teething issues and uh, 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 to, to some of the comments made earlier by my fellow panelists, you know, I have an experience of, uh, of my, my friends complaining of even just like opening a bank account in Thailand is very complicated for a non-local, you know, just getting a, just opening a bank account, <laughs> multi levels of, uh, of issues that have to address. So things, things like that. It, so it, it, it has to, that, that's an optic issue because it, it doesn't give the assurance to, to foreign investors that, um, while well, everything sounds great, all looks good, but when it comes to uh, the needy greedy, there's still a lot of you know teething issues that needs to address. And now, when you have no competitors, that's okay. But when you have other regional competitors that are happy to step in, and so so you know Thailand cannot just um, take their own pace. They really have to step up and make make things uh, more friendlier uh, to, you know, foreign investment. Thank you, Bernard. And I think you made a very fair point concerning what Thailand could do in order to deepen or rather to unclutter and lower the barriers to entry and access for not just Chinese capital, but also international capital at large. I want to actually sort of turn the attention back towards if China. I, if I may, uh, Sorry, Brian, if I may just... Uh... Uh, yeah. add, add, add another side of that mm -hmm. argument as well, which is uh, that actually the, the Chinese themselves also need to step up um, in their, you know, in their ways as uh, behaviors uh, abroad. Because if they're going to really be be successful, you know, outbound investors and and um, you know outbound builders of infrastructure, uh, you know, they have a lot a lot more to learn as well. Uh, you know, they need to be more reliable partners. They need to be better partners. They need to know how to how to share. You know, um, it's it's a 
you know the 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 at least the private businessmen who 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 are big enough to get a, to 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 venture abroad they have become this successful because they take no prisoners and this is okay if you're in your own home country take no prisoners fine that, that's why they're so successful but if you do the same thing in someone else's backyard you know you're going to get driven out sooner or later and you know and and i and i'd like to mirror that you know what what uh, kun bernard said uh, earlier which is you know chinese do learn very quickly and they have been learning and one of the, the you know the 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 most interesting things that I've, I've been noticing recently is that they've even been using BRI less. I mean, the, the, if you notice like how you know, the speeches that ambassadors give or people give, uh, foreign affairs people give, it used to be de rigueur that you'd say it three, four, five times in a speech. Now you'd have it maybe once. You know, yesterday I, I, I was on a call, uh, you know, with a fellow FTI members uh, with the Chinese ambassador. I don't believe he mentioned it even once. Of course, the content of what was discussed was all uh, kind of BRI. So they're doing it's BRI in all but name, but clearly there's been there's been a, a de-emphasis on the term BRI in favor of the term kind of common prosperity or, or you know the, something more vague and more more aspirational and less less kind of targeted and focused and directional. Thank you very much, Joe. Because you just preempted, I think, quite. You know, ingeniously, the question I was about to ask, which is exactly on what you said just then, you know, what exactly could and should China do? Because uh, roping in a question from the audience here, from Thai news, it seems that at least certain segments in the Thai public don't necessarily welcome or believe in the efficacy of Chinese originating vaccines. And amongst other segments, there have also been, I guess, increasing alarm and concern towards what is painted perhaps by certain media outlets as an aggressive, revanchist form of nationalism projected by Chinese abroad. Now, I don't necessarily think that the target or the brunt of much of this nationalism has been Thailand or is Thailand in status quo, but it does beg the question at large, how exactly could China improve the optics, perceptions, and also standing, not just in Thailand, but also perhaps in relation to the rest of ASEAN? And here, I thought I might ask uh, Dr. Bukin to comment before inviting uh, Tida and Bernard as well to pick up on Joe's comments earlier on. So, Dr. Bikin. Okay, I, I will talk uh, broadly because uh, the way the Chinese do business in Thailand is different from other countries. For example, Western countries, when they do business in Thailand, they will think about the legal framework first. Why China, China you know, and Chinese people, they think about how can we get it successfully. Uh, sometimes they, they don't think about uh, how to comply with the Thai law or anything else. Why you? You're just concerned about, you know, very, for foreigners, very difficult. It, it, it looks uh, very beautiful coming to Thailand, but to apply for anything, very difficult. There are so many, I mean, uh, steps to do. And every step, many times you have to pay. So you have to consult, uh, I mean, uh, uh, good lawyers, good uh, law firms. Okay, international law firm, but, but Chinese, they don't care about this. Even for the Thai products like uh, vegetable fruits, uh, they, what they do, they come to Thailand, they trade with the Chinese people in China. And it, it's not Thai people trading with Chinese people in China, but it's the Chinese people in Thailand trading with Chinese people in China. And the Thai people, they, they understand, they do not understand well how to how to trade with uh, the, the Chinese people there, okay? This is a problem. That's why we have to, to solve many problems. As I just said that uh, we, we need not the law, but law suspension, and this is a law suspension for three years or five years. So let people have sandbox and, and think what is the, the appropriate, I mean, uh, steps to do together. How can we create a one-stop service in, in, in reality? I think we can do that, okay? And now what i'm thinking is that uh, not only we liberate and empower our people but for foreigners as well coming to thailand doing business you must be treated as the thai people you must find that this country is so easy and but but legal we, we will not put on i mean the burden on on your shoulder or even our people okay 
if we cannot solve this problem within this coming five years, I think Thailand will be, I mean, left behind other countries. Vietnam, they can do Loki Yotin very easily because you know very well Vietnam and China and Laos is a communist country. We talk about the continuity in China. That that's that's why China is successful in doing many things. But in this country, no continuity, no continuity at all. Once you share the government, once you say the school data, we change everything. If even you cannot change, you change the words, change the names of that project, and that's all what you do. That's why this country cannot move two step and back one step and move two step back one step like China. We move one step and be back two step or three steps like this for almost 90 years. That's why we are thinking about this. So I, I like to say that uh, Thailand, you know, we we are, we, we are, I mean, great country. You see that in this area, in ASEAN, Vietnam has problem with China, Indonesia has problem, even Burma in the north of Burma and which Thailand has nothing. We have no territorial conflict with China. We, that's why many of you said that uh, we are so close with China, not only for race, but everything. That's why China is looking to Thailand as not, not I mean, uh, uh, counterpart, but as brother. That's why I said that when I, I went to China, they call me Ge Ge, and I call him Ti uh, It's because we, we feel so close. That's why when we have no problems of uh, territory, no problem beliefs, everything, so we can promote this. But I like to tell my, my Chinese uh, friends that we have to do business in Thailand like other countries. And um, I, I think that um, I'm lucky to meet some people. Uh, you know, Jing He, uh, uh, Chinese, uh, one of the biggest Chinese law firm, they want to open and I'm a subsidiary here in Thailand, like in Singapore, and they talk with me. I told them that when Chinese uh, money investment come to Thailand, Chinese people come to Thailand more, we have to do this like, like other countries and Thailand will be easier to, I mean, to correct, I mean, bad practice or anything else to cope with, I mean, the future and to, to take care of our people and foreigners coming to Thailand because we cannot build our country, just only our people. We need everyone to come and to help us. Thank you very much, Dr. Bokin and Tida and Bernard. Would you have any strong thoughts on this question before we move on to the concluding remarks today? As time is unfortunately running out, despite how pleasurable our conversation is. Um, Tida? Okay, so I'll just give a short so we can move forward um, to the conclusion. I think I think in order for China to become a better partner for Thailand and also for, for other countries and other partners around the world, I think uh, China should focus on uh, a few things. One would be in terms of communication. I think um, a lot of people who really try to understand China and who, who have a close ties to China will understand that, you know, for example, famous phrase, things like China trying to promote like community with shared future for mankind. But I think there, there's still a general, you know, misconception, a misperception that a lot of people still do not quite get um, the very intention of what, what China is trying to do. There's a lot of also preconceptions saying that um, that's not entirely um, the, the goal of what China is trying to achieve, where there's a hidden agenda and things like that. I think, I think in terms of focusing on the very communication um, for the general public to really understand that really matters. Um, you, you look at the very uh, core, the concept, it goes along with a lot of things that the UN is trying to do, for example, with SDGs, you know, is it some something quite similar? When you when you change your face, then it becomes something with totally very different perceptions. I think second thing um, that we we have benefit from China a lot is in terms of the win win cooperation they're trying to promote. I think um, there are a lot of countries who who sees um, this this kind of relations are not being totally win win. It, it could be win lose, for example. I think if China is really trying to push for that win win cooperation um, until the very end and ensure that this is um, something that they stand for and there's something they also practice uh, entirely then I, I i don't think i don't think anyone could say that china is uh, in any way a bad um a bad uh, a bad partner right 
And lastly, I think um, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of people saying that China is trying to impose like soft power, you know, Chinese soft power on many countries, including Thailand. Um, I think I think that there must this uh, this myth must also be a little bit understood a little bit better in terms of saying that in order for anyone Thailand even um, to adopt this kind of soft power or any cultural um, cultural power um, into into their own country, I think it, it ha there has to be acceptance into into that particular culture and into particular power how a lot of people misunderstood uh, how China is imposing self power and many countries in Thailand so I think I think for China to become a better partner you know there, there are a lot of these things that needs need to be a little bit better understood thank you very much Tita and Bernard in fact, I'd just like to uh, also echo on the point raised by Kun Tida and Joe early on about um, both uh, you know, China and Thailand uh, was both need to uh, improve um, in communication, uh, not just government to government level, but people to people's level. Uh, because mind you, I mean, China is a huge country. Uh, and, and I said early, you know, China, uh, I'm sure they will continue to learn from their own mistake and try to how better to improve those relationships. Because after all, I mean, they, they, I think they are mindful that they are being seen as this, you know, five thousand pound, you know, gorilla walking down the street. So everyone got <laughs> got got intimidated, right? So I, I I think they understand and they and as and I said early on that they see this relationship is a very long term one, right? So. It's not how one party take advantage of the other. No, no, no. I think this idea of how do we make this a sustainable, and I think to the point Joe mentioned earlier, this is now the, a new buzzword in China, which is common prosperity, right? So everyone needs to win, right? But, but of course, uh, a slogan is one thing. You know, how do you actually make it work? Requires still some teething and learning and, 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 you know, hopefully that uh, we we don't repeat the same mistake we make. And I think to the point Joe made earlier already on, I think it's rightly so when, when China first, you know, blasts off of saying BRI, then I think it got, it, it got a bit of pushback, you know, largely because of maybe people are intimidated, people don't understand what is BRI, what is the agenda behind BRI. So I think they now learn it and Oh, maybe perhaps, uh, but the, but the, but the, the effort behind the same is just that maybe it's a better way to present it, and you you have to earn trust. So I think you know, and and trust goes two ways, right? You know, Thai needs to be feel trusted, and so as the Chinese. So I think um, so. I, I I'm all in all, I I feel uh, I feel um, definitely there's good uh, merits, and both and both sides to want to uh, make this relationship uh, work and last. Thank you, Bernard. And we now come to the final round of essentially concluding remarks for a very exciting and scintillating conversation today. So here's the elephant in the room. Uh, it's year 2021, and obviously there are escalating relations and tensions between the US and China. Some say smaller states and medium powers have no choice but to stay neutral. Others say the time has come for smaller and medium states or indeed regional economies and powerhouses to take sides and to really show and decide where the loyalties lie. In this tussle between the US and China, how should Thailand position itself going forward, assuming that these tensions are to last, which obviously from my personal point of view, I hope they won't, but unfortunately probably will. So I guess what we can do here is just tying in everything we discussed today, we can go in reverse chronological order, starting with Tida, then Joe, then Bernard, and finally Dr. Bikin would have the last word today, uh, if that's all right. So, uh, Tida, would you like to start us off? I definitely think that Thailand should stay neutral in this particular trade war between uh, between China and US. I, I see Thailand's strength um, as actually um, in, in its in neutrality. I think you've seen Thai, Thai history like throughout the time. Thailand's always been trying and trying to really remain neutral. But never, never mind the history. Right? I think what's really happening right now is we need to project and to to look at the situation that's happening now. 
there the two things are shaping um, shaping the global landscape. One is the world um, after the COVID-19, the COVID pandemic. I think a lot of things are changing. Even what Thailand has been doing before, relying on tourism and a lot of things like that, um, it, it's not going to work anymore for you in the future. So by cutting ties with one of your major allies, um, being US being your oldest allies in, in Asia, having China as being um, as, um, the, biggest, um, the biggest population of tourists coming to Thailand pre-COVID-19, and with a great potential for anything to contribute to Thailand even further. Um, to, to me, I don't, I don't think it makes any sense. But it should not, uh, Thailand should not stand in, in, in its uh, neutral ground only in terms of the US and China. It should look further beyond uh, in terms of um, it, it, it is, um, the, the whole region being ASEAN and even further, um, you can, can go to um, East Asia, even India, South Asia, and, and any other, other countries too. So I, I think in order for Thailand to be able to survive in this kind of situation, I think it, it makes sense that Thailand uh, stays smooth. Thank you. Thank you, Tita. Uh, over to you, Joe. Thailand uh, has this kind of unique ability, it's a superpower. And I believe Thailand alone has a superpower to be simultaneously with China and with America and in the middle. And in fact, I might even go as far to say that uh, Thailand doesn't know any other way of doing other than being kind of everywhere at the same time. Uh, it's a unique, uh, it's a unique um, trait of Thailand, and, and I think that is that is where we our future lies. Um, you know, the the future is is going to be increasingly complicated. Uh, the the relationship between uh, China and the West is is not going to mend uh, easily. Uh, China is now actually going through a period where, uh, they, you know, they're kind of closing in on themselves. Uh, there is, you know, all these big, big the slogans have changed. You know, BRI is moving to, you know, common prosperity. They used to say, um, you know, we want to build, uh, you know, infrastructure and provide capital around the world. Now it's in promote internal consumption, right? Uh, it used to be globalization and en engagement. Now it's uh, dual circulation, which, by the way, in Chinese is which is means internal circulation. So this is the backdrop against which you know Thailand is you know treading, and then on the same at the same time in the West you have a very, very kind of uh, any uh, a lot of animosity towards China, and so so it's not going to be as easy as it used to be. But you know as Thais we have this, um, this great ability. Uh, however, I must say that uh, you know having this ability being good friends with China, even family, you know, Jiaqin with China, is really no substitute for actually doing the hard work that needs to be done. And, and that's really where, where Thailand needs to be focusing on. Thank you very much, Joe. And uh, Bernard? I think uh, politics will remain uh, polarized. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about between Thailand and China, I'm talking about um, the world politics today. Yeah, they will remain very polarized. And uh, so I doubt there's much we can all do because it's not just about Thailand and China, it's about the rest of the world and how all these these uh, uh, politics thing play out in individual countries and so on. But I think what you need about Thailand and China is the fact that, and Joe will talk about friendship, and that it's about business too. There's a common interest uh, among Chinese company as well as Thai company, right? So I think we can easy, Thailand can easily navigate within you know the 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 more on the the practical aspect right there's there's not a lot of room i suppose uh when when you caught in this whole geopolitics between you know these countries to country issue but but we can definitely take advantage of that common interest to um to for common interest to increase prosperities among people in thailand and china so with now technology in play, so I think you know obviously China can offer a lot of support in digitizing you know um, the ASEAN. Meantime, there's a lot that ASEAN and hopefully Thailand is leading that to help China, you know, especially in areas where China need most uh, most help. Um, so you know you know long term retirements to you know, um, greening is definitely other one issue, sustainability, because China's already committed to uh, 
carbon neutrality by 2050 or 2060, I think 2060, and so all these things. So there's a lot of other things we can do together, you know, but without all the the limelight on the policy side, because the policy side will remain, um, uh, you know, complicated, I would say. Thank you very, very much, Bernard. And finally, to round off our discussion today, uh, Dr. McKinn, thank you very much. Yes. Maybe in short, I'd like to say that my country, I mean, the Thai people, we learned a lot since uh, World War II, because after World War II, we have a Cold War. And you know that the, during World War II, after, after that, uh, uh, during that, we, we declared wars against the Allies. And we have, uh, because every Thai, to fight against the Japanese in Thailand. And we contact, uh, I mean, or free Thai movement in China, in Britain, in the US. And finally, this is the only country that the Allies said that the war declared against them is void because it's not the in real intention of the Thai people. And this is Dr. Brady Panom Yong who lead, I mean, who led the country at that time. I think, uh, that's why now we have to learn to live with superpowers. Uh, that's why I think that we have to promote peace because without peace, we cannot develop. Don't talk about or think about green development or any kind of sustainable development. Without peace, we cannot do that. That's why we have to live peacefully and bring us in to live peacefully like us and bring other countries to realize that Without peace, we cannot do anything. If you want to create war or, or anything that looks like war, it doesn't benefit anyone. So uh, if I have an occasion to run my country again, this is my position. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. It is incredibly apparent by the end of this discussion that the sino thai relationship is not just one of importance to both of the countries involved, but also to ASEAN at large. And yes, there are indeed predicaments, impediments and calamities ahead, whether it be in a form of international geopolitical tensions or divergent economic values and also interests. But amidst such divergences, we can only hope, and indeed there exist very few options other than one in which mutual collaboration and honest dialogue and forthcoming exchanges would hopefully pave the way for a better relationship, not just between China and Thailand, but also between all stakeholders and also individuals involved in this relationship. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And we've now come to the end of the panel. Thank you all and good night or goodbye. Okay, good night. Thanks,